I'm Hillary Hendershot, your host, and this is Profit Boss Radio, episode 94. Profit Boss Radio is your weekly wealth mastermind. Profit Boss is also a community and a movement for women who are ready to take control of their money, break the glass ceiling, and give ourselves permission to finally have enough. Want the secrets of wealth to be yours? This is the place. I'm Hillary Hendershot. I'm a certified financial planner running a leading advisory firm for women, and I'm sharing with you real stories from real life and real women who are making it happen. Forget Wall Street. Let's do this, ladies. Pretty incredible interview for you today. This woman, Annie, and she'll be known only as Annie uh, for the purposes of the interview. She's actually a client of mine. She inherited an estate worth about $4 million from her parents in her early 40s. And it didn't go smoothly. So some of the plans her parents had put in place never got finalized. And uh, she ended up having to go through quite a lot to get her hands actually on the money. Not only that, but Annie was someone who had a bit of a destructive money operating system. And in this conversation, she talks openly about how it has felt for her to receive the money and to identify with herself as someone who is wealthy and and the things that she's done to be a responsible steward of that money. Time Magazine reports that one in three people who receive an inheritance blow the money. So they spend it or lose it. They don't steward it effectively. And and it's not really surprising because people who don't already have money haven't built the skill of keeping money. So earning money is a very different skill set than keeping it. And you can hear Annie talk through some of the things that she's done and gone through and some of the people she's reached out to, myself being one of them to make sure that she stewards this money responsibly. She feels a big obligation to it for her parents and her daughter. And I I think that that's lovely. You will hear her talk about some of the things I've done for her on her behalf during this period of time. I just want to be clear that none of that is in any way a testimonial for my investment management services If you don't know, the federal government prohibits investment advisors from publishing testimonials for their investment advisory services. So absolutely nothing that Annie and I are talking about has anything to do with um, how I've invested, how we've together decided to invest her money for the long-term future. Thanks for listening and enjoy this conversation. Annie, thank you for joining me. Thank you, Hillary. It's Really, really awesome to be here. A little nerve wracking, but I, I'm really excited. Thank you for asking me. <laughs> you have quite a story to tell. And um, I really think this is going to just really blow people away. So let's kind of start from the beginning. You always kind of knew that you were going to inherit money. How was that communicated to you? And was it real for you? Did you really know how much there was? How did that go? I think I knew kind of early on, maybe, you know, early teen years, it start, I started becoming aware of uh, my parents' worth. I didn't know how much. And my mom kind of told me as I got older into my, you know, later teens, early 20s, you know, they would, she would joke with me, you know, about uh, inheriting the house and whatever. And I obviously live in the Bay Area. I know the value of things around here. And I knew that my dad was very successful in his career. He's a double PhD, chemical engineer, just really was very conservative with money. So, but, and I knew that he always put stuff away and he bought, had stocks. And so I didn't know how much, but I knew they were well off. I didn't get any of it really. <laughs> they made me work for everything, uh, which was good. I knew they were trying to enable me or excuse me, empower me, not enable me. Um, <laughs> and so when you say you didn't get any of it, you mean well, you mean, weren't a high earner, work. right? I mean, they, they didn't spoil me. Oh, you know, oh, got it. You know, I had to get a job at 15 and a half if I wanted a car, you know, and I had to pay pay for my way for anything that I wanted. So while I knew there was money in our lives, I didn't see it directly except for where I lived and that they would be able to lend me money if I paid them back, those sorts of things. But then, you know, that my parents started aging. I became more of a responsible adult. My late 20s, early 30s, I became a mom. 
And of course, the conversation which started shifting, they started becoming more candid with me. Uh, I think I started realizing truly what their net worth was after I became a mother in my early 30s. So for about the last decade or so, I knew. And that, but it was such an abstract thing to me. I didn't relate to it. I knew it was coming far, far, far in the future. I didn't know it was coming this soon. Mm -hmm. But I've lost both my parents in the last five years. So losing my mom five years ago um, was awful. Hoped to have my dad around for another 10, 15 years, but he passed away this last March. So all of this is still very unfamiliar and strange. I was hoping to have my parents for, you know, a long time and I would be retired myself possibly when I inherited the money. Right. And I think, you know, my impression is that's been one of the hardest things for you is in some way you feel like you've exchanged them for the money. Correct. Even though obviously you had nothing to do with it. Right. Yeah. It's hard to reconcile and it's still a work in progress for me. Yeah. Because I would much rather have them here. So now let's talk. I think you said your dad brought you to see the family attorney after your mom passed. Is that right? That's right. I sat in that office. He amended the trust so that I became the trustee, which, you know, you have to do, obviously, because my mom was no longer there for the, to be the trustee. And so I, I knew that that had been done. However, I never saw the final trust. I never saw the amendment. I didn't even know where the original wills were. And, and it was not conversations that me and my dad had. I just knew, I assumed that he had everything in place, but we didn't talk about it. Did he say anything about how he wanted, what he wanted you to do with the money? Aside from making some donations to organizations that my mom and him were huge parts of, no, no, he hadn't. Did you intuit that he had wishes for, for you for the money? For me? Yeah. Do you feel like there's something you're supposed to do or not supposed to do with it? <laughs> yeah, yes. <laughs> yes and no. Yes and no. So I knew oh, he adored my daughter, his granddaughter. I knew that he really wanted her to be taken care of, you know, college, making sure we have a safe home, you know, in a, in a safe neighborhood, mm -hmm. you know, the basic needs. But I also know that the way he was with money holding on to it and not spending it, you know, he, he, he wouldn't want me to go off and, you know, take lavish vacations and buy fancy cars, which I have no intention of doing. And in part, not just because he wouldn't want me to do that, but because it doesn't feel respectful. I feel like I want to continue to grow that money and protect it more so for my daughter, just like, you know, he wanted me to be taken care of, but just basic living if that makes sense. Right. So now when he died, it was a big surprise, right? Yeah, totally unexpected. I mean, he had some health issues, but it they weren't so pressing that we thought he was going anywhere, obviously. And it did. It took us the last nine months to find his cause of death. Um, we didn't actually know, actually, no, excuse me, about eight months. We found out about a month ago that he died of a heart attack, but we didn't know that for a very long time. So total mystery for many, many, many months. And yeah, uh, really unexpected. And he was out Very of the country. Shocking. And he was out of the country. Uh, him and my mom had a second home in New Zealand. And uh, they used to go biannually. And he still continued that, but he would only go for shorter amounts of time. He was pretty lonely there. So um, he had just left for his biannual trip in the spring, their fall. And he'd been gone maybe a couple weeks. And I couldn't get a hold of him. And I started to worry and had a neighbor go. And that's, yeah. So pretty rough, pretty rough way to find out when you're halfway across the world. Yeah. Really, really traumatic actually. Yeah. Cause the first thing you want to do is go to them. Right. So how have things unfolded since then? <laughs> <laughs> well, they've been pretty rough. In fact, um, I'm just starting to feel like I'm coming up for air I, I was no stranger to grief. I'd been through this with my mother. So grief alone is, there's nothing worse really. And, you know, you usually need to have space to just sit with that. And I don't feel like I've had the space to just sit with my grief because I got a crash course in settling in a state. I'm an only child settling in a state in two countries uh, without a will and trust because we couldn't ever find the will, the, the will or the trust 
we on, we only found the amendment, but it was unsigned. So now, and so I actually want to dig into that a little bit because when you first called me and said that you couldn't find the unsigned, you couldn't find a signed or notarized copy of the trust, I was I, I was almost incredulous. I I, th- I thought there's no way she won't be able to find this. Right. Um, although one thing I want to point out is a lot of people relate to the attorney. Like they think the attorney who drafted the trust keeps a copy mm-hmm. of it. And right. you unfortunately learned the hard way. That's not the case. Uh, no, I, it's not. The lawyer um, that he had used retired and was in an assisted living home and she no longer had her files. Yeah. And this was only four years ago that we sat in her office. Plus I had a handwritten note from my mother from way long ago saying, you know, there was a box under the bed and there was all this information and safety deposit box keys and instructions and all those things. And it said that the lawyer, the, the lawyer's name had a copy of the will and trust. So I thought that that must still be true. And, you know, after she died, my dad, you know, moved things around in that box, went and had the amendment made. And then who knows what happened to it? We don't know what happened to it. I even looked in New Zealand. Everybody looked everywhere in the house. I mean, it's amazing that we we still haven't found it <laughs> we don't know what, where it is so um so but we did find an, an old friend of my father's lawyer also um way back when he had he had moved away so he was no longer the lawyer but he found an old copy of the will but it wasn't original but it was enough for my lawyers to be able to move forward and they ended up having to recreate the trust based on puzzle pieces of what we thought belonged in the trust. And fortunately, because it was pretty clear cut, but it was a lot of work and many, many, many months of piecing things together, the judge signed off on it. So fortunately, after like six months, you know, I'm now being able to move forward, but it was very painful because a lot of the stuff that you can normally do in the beginning with settling an estate, I didn't even have access to. So I was borrowing money from my family to settle, you know, funeral home expenses, just even getting to New Zealand to bring him home. All of those things became like amplified because they were so scary. I didn't know what we were going to do because I didn't have all the things that should have been in place. And so here you are in a position to be inheriting the family wealth. But what's happening in reality, because you couldn't find the estate planning documents, is that you're having to pay for everything. Right. Right. And my lawyers did move as quickly as they could. Uh, once, you know, things started becoming clear about what had belonged in that trust, they were able to give me access to an account of his so that I could start settling the estate. Um, but that wasn't right away. I mean, it was about a month later. And in the meantime, I had to go to New Zealand and do all of those things. And yeah, it was really a very fearful and unknown time and very turbulent. So how long after he died did you land in New Zealand? Uh, about a week later. Sadly, we had just started moving the day I found out that he died. And so we had to move. And otherwise, I would have gotten on a plane that day. But for those four days, I just was in this very, very bizarre dreamlike state and finally got on that plane about four or five days later. And we were there for about four days. And it was amazing how many things I had to take care of there I didn't even foresee. So I had to go. There was no way I could have done it from here. I thought I could at first, but I just couldn't. Yeah. So that, that was, that was a huge learning lesson too. And Mm -hmm. and at first they didn't know how he died. Right. And so I hope it's okay to ask about this detail, but did they keep his body? Uh, They did. Well, no, they didn't. They took, the, the, the initial exam didn't show anything obvious, so they took pathology samples, and then they were able to, to release him to me. And the pathology samples are what took all this time. And because, because we didn't have the cause of death, I had an interim death certificate, and an interim death certificate says cause of death subject to coroner's findings. And there are a number of accounts that won't, like, or not just accounts, but um legal things, excuse me, that they won't, you can't move forward until you actually have a cause of death. Oh, it counts too, excuse me. Like the accounts that I was a beneficiary on, life insurance, they wouldn't do anything because if it was foul play or anything like that, they can't, which I completely understand, but it's 
taken months and months and months for movement to occur with a lot of his accounts. And he certainly didn't intend that, obviously. Um, you know, normally life insurance should be able to pay you right away so you can start taking care of things. Right. And also the other thing is in a foreign country, you have to go to the U.S. consulate to have the report converted to a um, report of a U.S. citizen's death abroad. And other accounts in the United States won't honor a foreign death certificate. So you have to have that report. Things I didn't know either. And so when I tried to go to the safe deposit box at Bank of America, they wouldn't let me in without it. And that report took two months. So and we were hoping that the will and trust was in that box and I couldn't get in. It wasn't ultimately. But um, but yeah, so things like that. You just don't know. You have no <laughs> clue. <laughs> Such like, a story of the road to hell is paved with good intentions. <laughs> truly, truly. Because your you parents know, did, took the time to create did. an estate plan and it was essentially yep. obliterated. Correct. And, I, you know, I, I don't blame my dad. He was really depressed after my mom passed away. And in shuffling everything around again, and you and I had talked about this, it, it, was, like, it, it was like he only went about 80% of the way, but it wasn't intentional. Right. He was just sad, you know, and I think that he thought he had time. And that's such a big lesson to me. I mean, now that I'm coming out the other end of this, believe me, I have a will and trust in place now and people know where it is. There's copies everywhere. Like I like I, I couldn't do this to my daughter, but we didn't know. Right. You know, you just don't know. You think you are going to have time. And and, you know, not just time to finish the things, but time to talk about things, you know, to to tell people where things are to, you know, tell them where the safety deposit deposit box keys are? Where's the will and trust? You know, all they seem like such basic things, but, um, but, but yeah, it's the things that disappear with our loved ones when they go the little pieces of knowledge that make the most difference that are the most costly. Exactly. Exactly. When we don't have them. Right. Yeah. Good. Okay. And so let's talk a little bit about kind of the pieces that were included, uh, well, I mean, what was the estate? So it was the family home. Two homes. So in the Bay Area and in New Zealand. Okay. Um, and, you know, and, or IRAs, stocks, um, account, you know, regular checking account, cars, two cars, not large amounts of things. I mean, they were, they were very basic. There's not a lot of them. But, you know, and of course they're property. And that's in and of itself, a, you know, a painful piece, but, um, yeah. So you mean you know, because going, they remind you of him? Well, yeah. And, you know, trying to figure out what, what was historical and valuable, you know, you don't, those are the other things that weren't talked about. I had to have his brother come and help me go through a lot of their old family things. Cause I didn't, you know, didn't know what certain artwork was. I would have sold it maybe at a garage sale and found out it was valuable, you know? And so, yeah, anyway, just other things you don't think about, but so what's life been like since he died eight months ago now? Um, nine. Nine months. Um, nine, yeah. And you basically have been full-time and almost still are, right? Settling yeah. this and organizing things for him. Yeah, it's not so much now, but it was for the first – I had to take an extended leave of absence from my business um, in the beginning because there was just no way. It was full-time for like the first like four months or so maybe even a little bit longer. And, and it's still, there's still things that I'm tending to um, that really can take a lot of chunks of days. So um, yeah, but it's been, it's, you know, and the, the other layer that is, that makes this so painful. And you've talked about this a lot, you know, you, you, this is one of the things I love so much about you and what you help to, to transform with people is their money stories and my layer of this old money story and not having a good relationship with money um, has made this even more painful. So I've been doing a lot of work around, you know, um, making peace with the money because it still feels like his. And I don't I feel very protective of it and I don't want to mess it up. And so I'm, you know, I'm. I've been talking to you. You've given me some other great resources of other people to talk to, too, to really help me work through this. Because it's not just the grief layers, but it's the, you know, the fear layers and the, um, you know, all these things that 
just get really entangled um, in your soul and you just it feels it still feels heavy in a lot of ways. And so I'm really working through a lot of that. And I just yeah, I, I yeah, I think re- it more than anything, I'm realizing this has been a, a huge catalyst to me finally making some serious changes because I, I, I don't have a choice anymore. Yeah. I absolutely have to. I have to for the health of my family, myself, my daughter. Let's talk a little bit about what you mean by changes, because I think you know one of the pieces of this story that's so interesting is how your relationship with with money was before bef- mm-hmm. before there was money. And one of the things you said to me that has, it just rattles around in my brain is, uh, Hillary, I, I marched in Occupy Wall Street. <laughs> <laughs> I did. I did. You know, and I think so there's this. I'm still the 99 percent. I still feel that way. Right. Yeah. <laughs> There's this movement of people. I mean, and it sort of always has been this way. It's not like a new thing that there are people who uh, think that people with money are bad, greedy, evil, selfish right. overlords. Right. Um, so talk a little bit about your perspective on that now. How's that all right. gone? Yeah. Um, well, and I still feel that way sometimes, <laughs> you know, like, I'm, so, and that, and that's, that's, the, that's part of what I'm trying to reconcile is, um, I mean, obviously my parents weren't bad people. You know, they, they were not nothing like that. In fact, they gave, they gave, they were, they were compassionate, beautiful, loving people that, that, you know, just, they, and they had good relationship with their money. Um, but for some reason, well, I actually know the reasons, but, um, you know, I, I grew up a little different with, with my relationship to money. And so, you know, I, I would always be envious, not envious, like in an unhealthy way, but I wished for money, you know, and I, I struggled in the Bay area up until this point really of, you know, month to month, client to client, you know, rent to rent, like all, you know, got, in, I was in debt. And so, you know, I always wanted uh, something more for my life. And so I would look at people with money and I would be, you know, like longingly like, Oh God, you know, I wish I could go on those types of vacations or whatever. But, um, more than that, it was just, I wish I had enough to live comfortably and not be struggling. And so, you know, but I would look at the elite or how I view them in the world. And I would, I, I, and I still do, like I said, some days still think that there is a lot of negative stuff around money and it's misused and there's a lot of greed. And, you know, I don't, I don't relate to it that way and I don't want to be that. And I don't think I ever will be. It's not like that at all, but I, but I don't feel like I'm in that group of people that has money. I still feel like I'm me and I'm trying to figure out how to survive in a different kind of way. And I think that I'll circle back to, you know, not wanting to mess it up and just those, those simple things and making sure that it's, that it's there for my daughter. And so, yeah, I, I, because I still feel like I would walk for Occupy, but that doesn't make sense, (laughs) you know, because I, I do feel like there's a lot of things in the world I would change about people with money. So there, there is a bit of a, a dissonance there, if that makes sense. Do you it's look tough. back on the woman who marched and Occupy Wall Street and see things differently now? Um, so, some ways, yes. Some ways, no. Yeah, I do because because I've gotten this crash course in finance and you know how money can grow and how my dad even got it to where it is. I have a new appreciation for that. Um, in fact, you know, I'm, I'm in awe of how he was able to make this for himself. So just understanding, like really learning, um, how, how investing works and the stock market, I never knew before because it didn't apply to me. You know, I didn't think I could have that life and now I needed to know. And so I've been really wanting to learn and I've been listening to your podcasts and, you know, reading books and, you know, doing everything I can to, to become knowledgeable. And so in that regard, you know, I don't look at wall street as a bad thing. I think it's really interesting now, but I, but the side of it where I still would march is the unfairness in some of the money world, the government world, you know, the, there are pieces of it that I still cringe at. Yeah. 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 So a little split down the middle there. (laughs) (laughs) What do you think is the total total value of the inheritance? About a little over four million. 
yeah. which isn't an astronomical number. Like I, that's why, you know, I mean, it, you know, so a lot of it is tied up in, in the houses in the, in the grand scheme of things. Like when I look, when I started learning about all this and I see like these huge accounts, you know, people with huge accounts and other people's net worth, it, you know, it doesn't feel like a, a lot. I mean, it is a lot, it's a huge amount, but, but in terms of, you know, the, my whole thing of not wanting to mess it up, it just feels like such a gift. I just, I almost don't want to touch it. (laughs) (laughs) Just stay there. (laughs) Yeah, it is. um, Even though to many who are listening, who are maybe in debt or living paycheck to paycheck, $4 million does sound like an astronomical amount of money. And it is astronomically different than what you've got right now. But the truth is, if you've got $4 million and you want to keep it around for years or decades, long enough to leave a legacy, you don't really got $4 million because you can't spend it. Right. (laughs) Right? So you have to be careful because you can, you can blow it any day. Yeah, Really. And, and just to kind of talk through some of the technicals for people, there's no inheritance tax on $4 million inheritance. So you didn't owe any of that money Mm -hmm. to the government. Right. And you get what's called a full step up in basis, uh, which means uh, for example, your your parents maybe purchased the home, which is worth a couple million dollars for, you know, $100,000 or something. And if they had sold it, they would have owed a quarter million or $300,000 in tax, capital even gains, after right. the capital gains exclusion for married oh, couples. right, right. But you now own a house that looks on the books mm-hmm. like it was purchased for essentially the, the value on the date of your father's it's death. Passing. Correct. Yeah. So, um, so that part is nice. Uh, as a person receiving an inheritance, it would, it would be terrible to have to pay 40% of it to the government. Right. Anything else you wish you had known? Yeah. I mean, things like, you know, taxes. I've, I mean, fortunately my dad had a really rock solid tax guy and he just like you has held my hand (laughs) through many things. Um, but you know, digging around and finding everything that I needed to report on um, for him because you have to file, you know, the current year, excuse me, I, I had to file for last year. I had to, he was alive for part of this year. So part of this year, and then you have to do a final one. And where are all the documents where, where, you know, and so like going and investigating and going through all your parents' things is like, you know, that, that too was, um, was a little shocking. Um, and, uh, why shocking? Uh, not shocking, but I, it was just something I never thought about, like something that I would have to do and like just puzzle piecing everything together and having the, the tax accountant, you know, really look through everything and say, yes, we have it. No, we're missing this. I'd have to go to New Zealand and find or not go to New Zealand, but, you know, call the CPA over there and provide this and, you know, all these accounts everywhere. There's just so many pieces and making sure everything gets reported accurately that that's one. And then the other thing was safety deposit box. If you have one, tell your kids or ask your parents, where are the keys? You know, little things like that, because when you don't know nothing and you're looking and you're guessing everywhere and you're in the midst of this grief, you know, just something so simple like that. Just so gosh, there's so many, there's, there's probably a million things that I'm missing right now, but um, <laughs> there were, there were a lot of things that had we spent, spoken, had everything been in its place, I would have been able to just sit with my grief and, and go through the, those things. And I just can't express enough to talk to your parents, to talk to your kids, you know, whatever, in which, whatever direction you need to go or both. So yeah, yeah, pretty, pretty painful experience. Are you, have you even able, been able to create a vision for your life that includes this money in the future? You know, what we haven't even talked about is the fact that you've moved into your family home so that you can upgrade and sell it. Yeah. So we were living in Marin and I was trying to go through everything down here on the, on the peninsula, um, where the, my, my family's house is, um, and going back and forth was also wearing on me. So we decided to move back in for a little while so that not only could I go through the things and figure out what was what and do it kind of, you know, in a, in a healthier way, um, but also to help with the letting go process, you know, being, being far away. And I know, I realize not everybody has this option. I mean, some people live states and states away or even countries away, but, um, but I had that, 
that, that option. And so it's been bittersweet being here, but we did decide to sell the house. I love this house, but it's not where we feel is long-term. So yeah, we are getting ready to sell it where we go. I'm not sure, but, uh, but the process that in and of itself, just going through my parents' things, figuring out what needs to be done around this house. This is like major adulting. Like I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, like uh, I've always rented. You know, I'm not. I don't. I've never had to deal with you know a water heater going out. Actually, that happened in at both houses in both countries on the same day. I'm not kidding. Oh <laughs> really, my goodness. Really weird. Yeah, things like this. Like I, I know that my dad is somewhere. Like you know, totally chuckling at me totally getting a crash course in home ownership, which is good. You know, I mean, I'm learning. It's obviously a, a gift all in all. It's, it's this huge gift, but, um, but there's been a learning curve, you know, with home ownership. Um, but yeah, I'm like <laughs> laughing, thinking about you standing in the middle of the house with the water heaters broken. And your first thought is, well, where's the landlord's phone number? <laughs> right. Exactly. Like, why can't I call my dad? So yeah, you know, things you're just not used to, you're just not used to it. Um, but it's making me step up in life and that's, that's good, you know, and it's, it's, <laughs> um, but yeah, we're, 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 we know that we need to make some changes. And honestly, after everything in the last five years from the death of both my parents, I need a change. You know, I feel like I need to start over in some ways and, the, the gift is going to allow me to do that. I just don't know exactly what it looks like yet. Cause it's still pretty fresh. Yeah. So we're, 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 just, yeah, I'm taking my time with it. Now I, I lost friends when I got married, even more friends when I had a baby, <laughs> how yeah. has this impacted your social life? I don't mean social life. You get what I'm saying. Yeah. Money has an effect on people. When sure. I had a baby, I became a mom. My life changed right. and some people right. aren't in that conversation. Right. Right. It hasn't because I'm pretty quiet about like the true circumstances around this, this shift. Yeah. You know, I mean, people, some people close to me know what I've been through. I don't think everybody knows all these details, but I felt it important enough to share this story. If I can help someone, you know, it hasn't, nobody really knows. <laughs> <laughs> they do now. I'll report back. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, I feel like, I feel like, you know, our network, our family and our friends, we have really wonderful people in our life and lives. And so, you know, I don't, I don't think anybody would look at me different. Yeah. I think, I think people would be happy for me that my yeah. parents were able to leave such, such a, a good, a, you know, an amazing gift for us. Well, I can't, I think, so I don't know about with men, but I do know that I work with a lot of women who have money and that with rare exception, they're generally very careful how they talk about it, not because mm -hmm. of privacy, but because they don't want to make other people who don't have as much money right. feel bad. Yeah. Right. Um, in fact, you know, it would be great if my clients would send me referrals all day long. But <laughs> but uh -huh. what the communication I get from many of them is my friends don't even know I have a financial advisor. I don't want them to know I can afford one. Right. You know, and so it's this, I don't know if it's shame or we assume that it's going to be a one up conversation. Like I'm, I have money, so my life is better than yours. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not really sure. Do you, yeah. do you feel like you hope people don't find out? Partially, yes. Yeah. yeah. And I think in part, it's, you know, I mean, I walked on Occupy Wall Street. I think I still <laughs> it's part of your personal brand, my personal brand, you know, and, and I have a lot of, a lot of friends that are the same. And, um, but yeah, I mean, I do, I have found that I, I, I have said that I have a financial advisor to a few people, but only in the context of helping me through this time, you know, because obviously my, both of my parents have passed and obviously, you know, there's, estate settling and all that. And I've said how much I've valued you, uh, you know, helping me through this. Like, I don't know what I would have done without you. And so I, I, I think it's important to share that kind of a thing, but no, I don't go into the details. And I think that that's, that is true. Like, I don't want people to look at me different. Yeah. And I don't, yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. I hadn't really thought about that before, but I think that that's true. So, so you say as a result, you've, you've already got your own 
uh, trust drafted, the will, the medical directives? And how have you handled this piece about making sure the people who need to know know where things are? For example, do you have a post-it on the refrigerator that says, here's where the safety deposit box is? Or right. how's that um, go? I have a fireproof safe and I, I, I haven't made the copies yet. I have digital copies out to family. The lawyer has copies this I know for sure <laughs> um and and I the emails that I have sent to family with the digital copies set has the you know the fireproof safe information has the lawyer's name and number um you know that's as far as I've gone I just had this thing drafted like a month ago um but yeah I mean at least I feel like there's enough people that know <laughs> where it is and of course have the, these, these copies. So I feel okay, you know, but I mean, I truly, I was afraid like, and, and we talked about this too. Like I didn't even want to get on a plane before I had those drafted. I was so scared and not scared. I don't normally get scared of getting on planes, but I mean, I, I, I was, you know, worst case scenario, my mom would have called it catastrophic thinking. You know, I, I don't have this will and trust in place yet. If something happens to me, it would have been a logistical nightmare for my husband and daughter. Because all these things were still in flux with with settling the estate of my parents. Oh, it would and have been so, it would have been oh, horrifying for them. Oh my god! Oh my god! So yeah, I mean, I really like I I literally two days before I got on the plane called my lawyer and he did it so fast and I <laughs> have felt really grateful and and really like I can breathe easier now that that piece is done. Yeah, I can't even express. <laughs> 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 so. Um, and oh, and one thing I wanted to circle back on real quick, I did forget that um, I the, the the New Zealand assets were never part of the trust. There was never any evidence that they were, and so I'm just now going into probate there. Um, and they didn't, they couldn't move forward because we didn't have the final dates of death and all of that um, until recently. And so, you know, um, if there's ever anybody, you know, thinking of getting property abroad or, you know, has property abroad, you know, make sure that that's written into the trust because every country's laws are different. And so, you know, I don't know what their reason was for not putting it in, um, but it certainly made things more complicated. Mm. So that's another big, big piece that I don't think any of us foresaw. So, um, so I know this has become quite a mission for you. True mission. (laughs) You think you'll write a book? Uh, I haven't gotten that far. <laughs> um, I thought maybe I would do a blog of some sort, you know, I don't know. Um, but I do, I do feel like this in type of information in this story needs to be out there and I'm still in the middle of it, you know, and I, so I think I'll know at some point. And, you know, when you asked me to do this podcast, my first thought was, Oh hell no, that's scary. <laughs> but then, but then I remembered how, how ridiculous this has all been and <laughs> how I never want anybody else to go through this because people should just be allowed to sit with their grief and, you know, obviously settle in a state. It should be straightforward. Yeah. So yes, this was important. And I feel like taking on the, the podcast is step number one. And if I can get this information out in any other way, I will. It, I, I, and I'll know when the time is right. Well, and I think you being willing being willing to schedule the interview and then do what you did to prepare for it and now give voice to this and and talk it the whole way through mm-hmm. is part of your own coming into yeah it's like it's like you're you're going to have you're you're growing up yourself <laughs> yeah it's part of my healing too. you're living into this inheritance yes. yeah 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 it's so true and it, it's a more important step than i thought so thanks yeah. i really yeah. Thanks for being Thanks, willing. Larry. Oh my gosh. <laughs> well, um, I can't thank you enough for what I know your voice has contributed to the Profit Boss Radio audience. Thank you thank so you. much thank for whatever it took to muster the courage and willingness to come and share. And not cry during this whole thing. Thank <laughs> you so much, Hillary. I might have to go cry now though, but that's okay. <laughs> it's good. Healthy. <laughs> Thank you for listening to this episode of Profit Boss Radio. If you liked it, share it with an artist or creative that you love. And whether you're a painter or a mathematician, may you have all the freedom and prosperity you want.